So welcome. Um, I'd like to introduce Raghavan Ventrakam. Now, Raghavan is a process engineer with a fundamental difference. And the reason I latched onto this was because in Atlanta, we, uh, in 2019, I think it was, Raghavan attended a workshop of mine <clears throat> where we were practicing the patterns of Toyota Carter. And in his feedback, he wrote what I have written here. I kept his feedback form because it uh, meant a lot to me. He said, I would never have thought about considering the human aspect before setting a target condition. I thought it was cool to use JR as a means to set the TC. I, that immediately set him aside. Um, and I don't mean to offend other process engineers because, he, because in process, he valued the human input. So Raghavan, you started at Normac in 2015. And what you said when we've, and I've had a bit to do with you since, you said when you were, uh, started back then, about 40% of your job was firefighting. And it's about five to 10% now is what you feel. So what was that 40% like? What did it look like back in 2015, the 40% firefighting? Okay, so first off, thank you Oscar for having me. And uh, I'd like to start by giving some context to what my job looks like at Normac. Um, so my job title is process engineer, and it's a little different from how process engineers in most companies work, because at Normac, the expectation is that a process engineer understands production, maintenance, and troubleshooting aspects of a process hands-on before you can go ahead and suggest improvements, right? So I'm there on the shop, you know, working alongside operators. Um, so in this role specifically, what happened was one of our frontline leaders left abruptly, quite abruptly, and then my VP of operations saw this as an opportunity for me to be like, okay, why don't we demonstrate to the rest of the shop how effective the concepts of uh, TWI and CADA and everything else is that we've read in books and attended workshops about. I was all upbeat about it and I took over the position. But when I did, the first thing I did was I started making improvements. I was noticing a lot of gaps. I would go ahead and start making improvements now, while my thought process behind uh, wanting to make improvements was quite logical most times, I ended up doing the uh, problem definition, I ended up doing the process improvement, and I ended up doing the follow through of the improvement also. So long story short, the people who were doing the job were just observers. Yeah, right. And I was there doing everything, and I was just expecting them to follow you know, along with what I did. So the, so just so I understand, they were Raghavan's improvements. So yes. when they worked, they were Raghavan's successes. And when they didn't work, they were Raghavan's failures. Yes, it, it, it had Raghavan all over it. And let me tell you, <laughs> it was very, very addictive. It was, yeah, right. <laughs> it, was, it was good to have your name on every single improvement and have people come up to you and be like, hey, Raghavan, how do I solve this? Oh, this is how you do it. It was, you felt like a superhero. It was yeah. very addictive. So you, begin, you sort of start on a bit of a power trip. Yes, yes. Yep. So, so that's how it was. And I'm, quite frankly, I liked it because the results were there and I was happy about the way I was getting it because I was not noticing the effect that it was having on people who I was working with, right? Yes. Until it got to a point where I started noticing signs of how it was wearing me down and the team down. Now, I'll yeah. talk a little bit about that. Yeah, what were those so, signs? As a matter of interest, what were those signs? What did you start to see? The first sign was um, a drop in the quality of communication or meetings I had with my VP of operations. Okay. Ah. So, so when we would meet on, you know, updates on how operations is performing, oftentimes I would snap and I was thinking about why was the case? Why was I snapping? And then I realized it was all this overburden of uh, this, this chaos that I created for myself that was causing a drop in quality of communication that I was having with my VP of operations. Yeah, right. And also with my members of, uh, with my team members, um, it got to a certain point where people were now not sharing any more observations because in their mind, they were like, well, he's got it. He's, he's already made all these improvements. I mean, he can make those observations. What's our role here? Right. Yeah, yeah. So, and I kind of sensed it 
And that's when I said, you know, this is not good. Addiction of any sort is never good. And so is firefighting. I got to stop. So Raghavan, how long did that take, do you think? You know, from when you started in that role to when you re suddenly realized, wow, I've hit a brick wall and this is what's going on. How long was that? Was that a month or we weeks, months, years? Or how long was that? I wish it was weeks, but it was months. It was about five, six months. Yeah, right. Uh, before I realized, okay, this needs to change. Something needs to change. Yeah, the addiction became a problem. Yeah, it did. It did. <laughs> physically emotionally uh it was mentally it was becoming a big problem not just for me but everyone who i was working with it's sustainable it wasn't sustainable yeah yeah yes it's what sometimes it interests me about lean departments in organizations when i hear them say we're going to do this we're going to do that and i often um wonder whether the, in longer term they will run into the same sort of issues as you ran into pretty quickly as an individual good so that's not good, but good, good, great description. So the fire, the firefighting, what did it actually, when, when that, at the end of that six months, when it was at its worst, what did your job, what was that firefighting looking like? What was it, what was your daily, you know, what, what confronted you daily? What confronted me daily was the fear that if I was not there, the processes would slide back. Uh, okay. So I was doing it so much, got to a point of like micromanaging to the core. Um, like I had this feeling that if I stepped out of the process, for some reason, the process would completely slide back and I would be responsible for its failure. Yeah. So it almost made me feel like, well, I'm the only one capable of handling the situation. No one else is. So I got to be there. Yeah, right. That's what I confronted the most. Like I would yeah. walk into a daily huddle. Like I would start my shift at seven o'clock and there they would, they would be operators who would start at like five or six. And then the first thing I would check when I went in at 7 a.m. is that all machines are actually good. There was no crashes. There was no quality defects or something like that because you go into a huddle. I went into a huddle thinking that something was going to be wrong. Yeah, right. Wow. But, all right. So now you feel when, you know, in the discussions I've had with you over the last few months that you're um, five to 10 percent of time firefighting. Describe your work now. And then we're going to and I just noticed a chat come up. What we're going to do then is describe. Um, I'm going to ask Raghavan to tell us how he filled this gap or how he changed, got from the 40 to the five to 10. So the five to 10. Now, what does your job look like now? OK. Today? So today, my job is focused on developing the scientific thinking skills of people closest to the job so they can improve their processes, they can do better training, and they can have better working relationships with people in their team. Okay? Right. That's a great summary. So long story short, what's actually happening now is my target condition is for people to not require me. And I'm extremely yeah. happy when someone says, oh, by the way, we don't need you anymore. Yeah, I love yeah. that. That reminds me of a production manager about 10 years ago who said to me that his aim was to sit in, in three years' time, to sit in the middle of the production floor and read a newspaper for the day and not be disturbed. And it was quite yes. interesting. He actually achieved it. Oh, let's not get into that story. It's not what it's about. He didn't sit in, but he actually achieved redundancy, effectively achieved redundancy. And I thought that was incredible and how people are fearful of that. Yet imagine if you could promise that to every organization that in three years time, uh, whatever role I have, I will have built the capability of others. So that role is not necessary. I think you'd get a job anywhere. I don't think there's anything to be fearful about. So if that's what it looks like now, Raghavan, the, the burning question obviously is, how did you get there? How did you do that transition from the 40% of you being the, the pinnacle of the whole thing to turning that upside down, if you like, and you being at the bottom of the triangle and the the, the people closest to the process at the top. How did you get there? Okay, so we're gonna play a little game of cards. And these are the two cards that I used uh, to get started. Okay, the oh. yellow card is the job relations card. Um, so I knew I had to fix the, the uh, friction I had with people in my team and with my VP of operations first before anything else. So I started off with, um, with practicing job relations 
by really having people come up to me and say how they were feeling about you know these six months where they were just observers and not be able to take part in any problem solving initiative and people were very frank they said you know it was terrible it was yeah, terrible man. the way i was going about things some people even like uh, got to a point where they broke down they were like you know you never listened to me you yeah, know man. and um, so that was good because i knew you know what i what i did wrong and after that, um, what I started doing was okay. So that would have been very I, con that would have been quite confronting. So <clears throat> I'm obviously I'm from <clears throat> excuse me, I'm from the institute. So I for those listening, so I know uh, the TWA Institute. I know the background to job relations. So the, just read please the in step one on job relations, the, the third and fourth question in step one. Uh, uh, step one is. As part of getting facts, you talk with individuals concerned, you get opinions and feelings. So their opinions and feelings that you were an, uh, being an impedance rather than a help. <clears throat> How did you cope with that? that? That's pretty confronting when you realize well, that I get told that. Yeah. In, in my case, it was not because I knew there was something wrong about the way I was approaching okay. things. Right. So I just wanted to know what was wrong and how I knew it was bad. I just wanted to know how bad it was. Yeah, right. Um, okay. So so it was not confronting. It was actually liberating. Yeah, right. More so for them to get everything out there and be like, OK, this is the problem. You need yeah, to right. change the way you work with people. Yeah, right. And, and I was You're a great glad listener. that it came out. You are a great listener, Raghavan. I've known you for a while now. We've had a bit to do with each other with, with other work. So you are a terrific listener. And I think that would have put you in very good stead. So then, okay, so then you started to understand that. Um, tell us how, you know, where, where did that take you then? You started to understand the importance of uh, what they were telling you. So where did you head then? So where I then headed was, so now after the problem with people had been not resolved, but uh, the effect of the friction had been you know, minimized uh, to quite a bit. I went to the front side of the card, which is about <laughs> building foundations for good relations. In my case, I was mm -hmm. rebuilding foundations for good relations. Yeah, so right. I started, you know, letting each person know how they're doing at every morning huddle. And whenever I got a chance, started giving credit when due. And then I realized, um, you know, I'll tell people in advance about change will affect them. But then the most important thing I realized was, I need to make best use of people's talent and abilities. Yeah, I'm not right. the only one who can do these things. There are people who can do better things than me and they are right here. I just have to identify who they are and get them up to that level uh, that they need to be at. So can you give us an example I... of can you give us an example of that with and don't name the individual necessarily, but where were you able to actually capitalize on that, make the best use of their ability? Okay. So this role that I took up was an interim role uh, where I filled in for a frontline leader who left quite abruptly, right? And the, and the area was in, um, in shangles really. So while I was leading the area, there was this individual um, and his name is Lewis, we can, we can say that. His name's Lewis and he is, and I've known him to be a very good observer, a very open-minded person and a very good problem solver, right? And, uh, and it did not strike me when I started that when I'm filling an interim role, I should be developing someone like Lewis to take this on long term so I can phase out and go on and do other things. But it did hit me six months later. So I, I, and when that six month mark hit, I realized, okay, if I'm going to make best use of each person's ability. My job now is to make Lewis the best leader he can possibly be. A so was he a leader campaign. at the time? Was he a leader at one of the leaders at the time? One of your frontline leaders? No, he was not. He was an operator in my yeah, area. Right. And uh, we, we share a very good, uh, you know, work relationship and a good strong yeah. JR line. So he would, in, in a sense, shadow, job shadow me on a lot of things that I was doing. Right. So he learned by doing. And yeah, right. uh, that's when I realized, okay, this is the guy who can take this team forward. Yeah, right. And where's he at now then? Is that is he in that role now? Or? 
Yes, I can proudly say that I have transitioned out of my role as a frontline leader. And right. now Lewis is the frontline leader in this area. Yeah. And uh, he is doing much more amazing things than I imagined. And uh, he is a better people leader than I was when I first started. Yeah, right. And I'm and proud to say that. That's good. Well done. Did he have those? Did he have those? Um, back when he was an operator, was it obvious to you that he had leadership skills, uh, leadership potential? It was, yes. Yeah, it was right. Very obvious. Yeah. yeah, good. So, what did you? How have you gone with uh, about developing him in particular? What skills have you helped him develop, particularly? What leadership skills have you focused in on? Okay, so when I started, I knew what knowledge and skills a leader should have. Okay, you should have knowledge of your work and responsibilities and you'd have the skill of leading, training, and then improving your work. I knew right. it. I just went about it the wrong way. So what were those so, three again? So leading? So a leader training, needs to have the skills of leading, training, um, and, and then improving, improving your work. Yeah, your work. Yep. And they should also have knowledge of the work itself and the responsibilities. Yes. So... Once I decided that Lewis would be the leader, I had to have a roadmap for, okay, now how do I develop Lewis's skills of being able to lead, train, and to improve uh, you know, processes? Sure. Okay. So I started with uh, leading. We made this yellow card discussion part of the everyday huddle process. Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, every morning and every afternoon, each team member would be expected to share a foundation for good job relations they practice with their team members. I'm interested there. So, because people often say to us, you know, where do you start? Why did you start with the leading, the skill of leading first up and not necessarily the other two that you've mentioned? Why that one? Here's my reasoning. Even when I was starting out as a frontline leader, the problem was not that I was not getting results. I was getting results, okay? The problem was that I was not getting it through people. Yeah, right. So if you want to get results through people, there's no way you can get that without good job relations. Right. So the improvement and the training, those come later. But yeah, right. having a good working relationship with people is foundational for any lean organization, is my belief. Sure. So, so do you think it would always come first, that one? Or do you think, you know, with other, if there was a, another Lewis who wasn't Lewis, maybe you would do that in a different order? Or would it be, do you think it would be a case-by-case case thing? Um, or would it always be lead, the, the yellow card first, so to speak, the, the, lead, the leading side first? Knowing what I know now, Oscar, I want to say it'll always be the yellow card first. Yeah. Uh, because I believe respect for people is the foundation of, you know, all of lean. And I don't know who said this, but uh, someone once said that the yellow card really operationalizes respect for people. Yeah, right. Uh, so if you want to start with respect, then that's the way to go. Yeah, yeah. So, and I think I'll always start with respect for people first. Very good. Okay, so then once with Lewis, we were you know, encouraging that and you said you were doing that through the habitual um, drawing attention to those elements on that card, you know, twice daily. What followed then? What followed then was, again, using the card to deal with people issues right when they occurred. Like when people were fearful of addressing an issue, even if it was with their frontline leader, um, or me in this case, we would encourage the operator to actually bring it up. Okay, let's get let's get a uh, a, a flip chart and write down the objective of what we want to happen here. State all the yeah. facts and go through this process. Let's make it visible. So, yeah, right. so we actually did that and we overcame this uh, this taboo that you know a operator cannot question a leader. So that that barrier was broken. Yeah, so, right. Anyone can that's, hold anyone accountable became the norm. That's really good because that requires a lot of trust. That require, you know, that, so was that, tr when you started the, in the organization, do you think that level of trust was there to be able to do that in 2015 or? Definitely not. No. no. 
I think we've definitely come a long way now uh, to where anyone at Normac is not afraid of holding anyone else accountable. Yeah, uh, good. And, and also giving credit, not just the back yeah. of the card. They're not, if someone does a good job, people say it. Yes. You know, if someone does a bad job, they say it also. So. <laughs> good. And I know, you know, from other work I've done with Normac, that, that the VP of operations and the boss, they're all on board. It's, it's not just you preaching the virtues of job relations. It's, uh, it's a team effort, isn't it? And it needs to be. If it was just you on your own, that wouldn't have worked. Yeah, it, it really is. And uh, I think Normac is lucky in that management is really invested into the concept of um, the job relations. Yes. Uh, because even and building when trust. as a team, and building trust. Um, and because even when we tend to move away, we tend to lose focus as team members, management always brings the focus back and say, okay, our job is not about making parts, it's about developing people who can make parts. And this is what we have chosen as the yeah. way to develop people. Yeah, I love that. It's not about making parts, it's developing people who can make parts. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's a very different, it's a simple, re, it's a simple adjustment, but wow, it's a very different view. Yes, isn't it? It, it really it's a very is. Very really simple really adjustment is. in words, but gee, it's a different sky, a different view completely. Yes, yes, yes. So tell, tell us, we've sort of only got about eight minutes left, and I know there's a couple of comments there that I do want to pick up on in the chat thing. But uh, tell us about the training side. So Lewis, you know, got on top of the yellow card, their job relations, and then there was the two others, the training and the improving your work. Just briefly. Yeah, so I want to talk about the training part. So when I went into this interim role and the frontline leader, you know, left abruptly, I had all but uh, a week of training. And I'm, in that week, I was trained on how to do changeovers on three different pieces of uh, machinery and also learn how to do production on those machines. And then the person who trained me also left. So basically I was there just with bits and pieces of information on how to do these processes. and. And I realized that was not going to work. If, if this is the quality of training that we were going to give to the rest of the team, it was not going to work. You were going to have machine crashes every day. You were going to have quality issues every day. Yeah. So what I did uh, is to use a recipe for training. You know, in <clears throat> TWI terms, uh, this would be called a job breakdown sheet. Uh, the, the, the concept is job instruction, but the tool we use is a job breakdown sheet where we would list out the important steps or the what, the key points or the how you do something and the reasons for why you do things a certain way. And we broke training into manageable pieces. So to give you some context, when I was trained on changeover, which has about uh, 20 to 30 different tasks, I was shown all the 20 or 30 tasks in one day, within an hour. All in one go, here, bang. Yes, yes. That was not gonna work. <laughs> so what now we do is we break down change over into 30 tasks and you train someone on one task a day it's one piece flow of yeah, training right. yeah, so you train it. them on one task you see that their knowledge has advanced and then when they're ready you train them on the next task yes. and then you integrate it all together at the end so that is what i did with lewis and with all the operators and that's what lewis continues to do with his operators it's gotten to a point where now when someone uh, a trainee is being trained without a job breakdown sheet. Trust me, they can tell the trainer, this is not the kind of training that I was promised. So, yeah, right. and, and the trainee has this um, freedom to, to tell the trainer that, and the trainer will go back and create a job yeah, breakdown right. sheet and only then take up training. So that pot potentially leads into why the job relations first, because you wouldn't that wouldn't happen if you hadn't built that environment of trust. Yes. Yes, I mean, wouldn't that what you just mentioned about the trainees, you know, speaks up if they're not being trained properly? That wouldn't happen if there was not an environment of trust. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and and what did we do every time, you know, a machine crashed? We always blamed it on the operator. We never yeah, ever right. blamed it on the quality of training that they received. Yeah. Uh, but now we are able to see that once the quality of training went up, the number of machine crashes has gone way down. Yeah, we don't. We used to have machines down every week. Yes. Now it's it's if it happens once every five six months for a 20, 30 minute span, that's a big deal. Wow. So that's terrific. 
that's a big yeah. that's a that's a that's a huge leap forward and what about the improving your work or the science is that the are you putting the scientific thinking side of things in that category which look the reality is that the job relations pattern you've spoke about is um scientific thinking for people in essence i always say it's pdca for people or scientific thinking for people but what about the improving your work what how what as you know what have you what have you gone down in terms of that and developing the skill there in terms of improving the work what we've done is we've followed the improvement kata structure um, yes. of, of uh, improving the work and the reason we chose improvement kata is because it helps you make improvements that are aligned and they give you a system perspective to improvements so the improvements yeah, right. are not suboptimal but system-wide um so, so not random people is that what you mean is you're not not an idea development system where it's random do this do that and they're a bit disconnected is that what you're saying is that they're all aligned exactly so in the past we'll use we'll try to improve process a and process a's efficiency would be high but only that process b would now have a heap of inventory sitting in front of it because process a performed so efficiently without thinking about process b yeah, yeah. so with with the improvement kata you kind of bring all those pieces together and you, you're able to gain a systems perspective of how to make improvements. So that is how we go about uh, making, that's one way of how we go about making process improvements is following the improvement kata structure. Yeah, sure. And to what level in the organization, um, the, the Lewis's of this world, are they coaches or are they still on the doing side of the scientific thinking? Uh, they are on the doing side of scientific thinking. Uh, yeah. They are learners at this point. Um, but what it's helped me do is I've now become a coach. So with all yeah, this right. time that I have now, uh, my firefighting time is now down to like 5%. So what I'm able to do now is I'm able to coach people like Lewis at different um, areas, and I'm able to have them all see how the work that they do ties into the bigger picture. Yeah, right. Um, and, and there's nothing more exciting than seeing people uh, you know, be proud about the work that they do, helping yes. them realize their true potential. There's nothing more uh, wonderful than that. Yeah, yeah, good. Well, we've got two minutes left and I'll just pick up on one of the chats and it's from uh, Greg Swan. And thank you, Greg. He says, what's your, advice, uh, what's your advice for people that are finding themselves in that same position now? Now, I think what he's getting at, I'm going to have to guess here, is in other words, what's your advice now for someone who finds themselves in the position that you were in five years ago or four and a half years ago, five years ago? My advice is to just think about, just think about this. If you were the only one making improvements, how long can you do it and how effective would it be versus you have, 10 or 100 of your team members making improvements every day, which do you think would be more sustainable? Which do you think would be more liberating? And which do you think, you know, shows more respect for people? I think the answer sure. would be obvious. It'll be to develop yeah, right. more people. Yeah, so your, so your advice is look into a means of developing the people who are doing the work or the, the, the frontline leaders. That would be your fundamental advice. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Raghavan, thank you. I think this conversation could have gone for probably another 15 minutes without any trouble, but we said half an hour and we're right on half an hour. So I really appreciate your time, Raghavan. I've, the thing I've always admired since I met you in Atlanta about you is your willingness to listen. And I think it's probably that um, attribute that you have that's allowed you to have this discussion now, because I think a lot of people in your role would have would have potentially closed off, but it was your willing, willingness to listen that has probably set you aside more than uh, a lot of other people that I've worked with. So thank you. Have a terrific uh, have a terrific afternoon. And with a little bit of luck, I will see you at the TWI Summit or the CarterCon in March next year on Jekyll Island. I'd love to be back in person in America again. It'd be fantastic. I hope I see you there. Yeah, I mean, I look forward to seeing you there, um, Oscar. Again, thank you for the opportunity. And, uh, you know, thank you for providing me with all the insight that I have now. I mean, I've worked with you quite a bit. And I've learned a lot of stuff from you um, and the TWI Institute. Um, so, And vice versa. Yeah. <laughs> from your learnings, so, I've learned too. So we've, had, we've both had a win. So thank you. And those of you who've joined us live, have a great afternoon and great day. Thanks a lot.
Thank you. See ya.